Okay, if it's okay, I'm gonna sit during the classes just so it's a little more laid back. And um, so we're gonna go into the letter of James, one of the Catholic epistles. And before we go into the text, and we're gonna begin chapter one tonight, then we have to just do a little background about who wrote the book of James, about when was it written, uh, what was the audience that it was written to, and the main themes. So we have a background to the sacred text. And, uh, the reason we have Bible studies is, you know, a lot of times you read the Bible, you have no idea who they're talking to, and what context it's being said, and when you have a better understanding, when you hear these texts at Mass, or if you're reading the Bible on your own, hopefully you will deepen your prayer life, and that's the whole point. This word is to change our hearts. Now first, let's start with the author of the book of James. Now, you know, obviously you've heard the joke, he's buried in Grant's tomb, you know, Grant, but, but the, there are three James St. James in the Bible, okay? There's the two apostles, James the Greater, James the Lesser. And then there's also um, a bishop called St. James the Just, who's mentioned in Acts chapter 15. Scholars believe it was that third, the third uh, James, not one of the two apostles that wrote the book of James, okay? Uh, so it's not one of the two apostles, but there's a third James and if you want, actually, let's turn to the Bible to see where we see this particular James. Uh, turn with me to Acts chapter 15 and uh, verse uh, 13. Okay, so we have here in this Acts chapter 15, this is the first uh, council, ecumenical council called the Council of Jerusalem, where they're arguing over whether or not should Jews, uh, should Christians, go through the process of becoming, going through the Jewish customs first. Remember this? There was a whole argument. Should they be circumcised? Should they, uh, like Jewish people, not eat meat? And, and there was a huge debate over this because, remember, Christianity uh, extended well beyond Jewish people. It's all these Gentiles. It's like, we don't need to be circumcised. We want to eat you know, hamburgers. We want to be Christian, not Jewish. And so this is the Council of Jerusalem. And after Peter speaks, it says in Acts chapter 15, verse 13, after they finished speaking, James replied, in other words, James, brethren, listen to me, Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take out of them people for his name. Okay, he's, now this James would have been the first uh, bishop of Jerusalem. He's not one of the two apostles. He's another James. Okay, I didn't know this until recently, so if you didn't know this, I found this out a day ago, very recently. So I always thought it was one of two apostles, it was not, okay? So who wrote it? James, but it was James the Just. All right, second thing, when was it written? Um, the epistle would have been composed before uh, this particular James was martyred. Uh, we know from uh, history books that this particular James would have been martyred in 1862, okay? So roughly, uh, you know, 30 some years after, or almost 30 years after Christ had died on the cross. Okay, now, if it was another author, which is always the possibility, some scholars say it could have been a fourth guy. If it was, it would have been between 80 and 100 AD. All right? So, more, like, more than likely, we have James the Just, the Bishop of Jerusalem, wrote it. When did he write it? Well, sometime before 62 AD. Why? Because he was, he was martyred. So, it had to have been before that he died. Deductive reasoning. Okay, now thirdly, audience. Who did he write it to? And we'll go into this when we get into the text. But uh, James um, yeah, would have written this for a very broad Christian audience, but it's, it, we'll, we'll see this in the text, it's written to the 12 tribes of the dispersion. Okay, we'll see this in the first couple of lines, actually the first line of the book, which we'll get to very shortly, it's going to say that it's written, James, the slave of God, and our Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes of the dispersion, greetings, okay? Now, we're going to go more deeply into this, but what this means is the dispersion were Jewish people that were moved outside of Jerusalem and started Judaism in other countries. They were dispersed, okay? And a lot of them would have become Christian. So they were Jewish Christians in other lands, most likely. It's a very Jewish text. Okay, you, you with me? All right, so we're going to go more deep into that. And what are the main themes? Okay, now, uh, the main um, main uh, uh, themes is first is how to deal with trials and suffering. It's a big theme in the book of James. 
Uh, he'll say, like one of the first lines in the book of James, he'll say, consider it joy to encounter all kinds of trials. You know, when you read that, like, what are you talking about, Lord? You know, it's, I'm, I'm suffering here. He's like, well, consider, you know, find joy in this. Okay, we'll explain why we should find joy even amidst trials and suffering. Okay, now remember, in the early church, it was not a walk in the park to be a Christian. And I think it was kind of uh, one of those, those experiences where, you know, they became Christian, all of a sudden their life kind of turned upside down. Any of you went to that St. Paul movie, uh, St. Paul the Apostle, that was made very clear, where this first Christian community is like, what in the world? We're getting martyred, we're, our kids are getting killed, uh, we're hiding, we lost our homes. You know, what, what good is this? <laughs> right? So, and, and I think this text will help us to see, well, what happens when bad things happen to us? Is it always a curse? Or do we have to have a more supernatural perspective and see sometimes that God's gifts come in strange packages? So a major thing is how to deal with trials. I think the value of suffering. Uh, secondly is sort of, uh, you know, deep detachment from riches. He's big on sort of not showing uh, uh, preferential treatment to the rich and, and the poor. Remember that Christianity sort of took away all class distinctions. And he's like, Let's listen, in your communities, you know, don't show preference or treatment to the people with the big pocketbooks. I think sometimes in churches that can happen, you know? And they get their special pews and, you know, plaques on the, you know, certain things that, you know, okay, well, this, uh, what would James think about this, you know? Uh, uh, the other thing he'll talk about is, uh, uh, and also the power of prayer. Hmm? And we'll talk about the power of prayer. So these are some of the themes that we will discuss in these five chapters. All right, so that being said, let's, let's just jump into the text. Now, let's talk a little about Bibles. I would say if you have a New American Bible, excellent text. Or, uh, this one, I believe, uh, is a little bit different, uh, but I'm going to try to stick with what you have. I have two Bibles here, one I use for my study. Now, for study, this is excellent. I got this a year ago. It's called the Didache Bible. Uh, it's, uh, and what it has is underneath the text, it links up all the, the Bible verses with the specific teachings of the Catholic Church underneath it. So a text would point to a particular teaching in our faith that's important. So it's kind of taking the catechism and it's linking it with the Bible. Very helpful, you know? So that's one, one thing that might help. This is actually the whole Bible it goes to the Old Testament and New Testament. Uh, but just for the class, you'll really just need the New American Bible, which you get anywhere. All right, so let's go into the text. So, James chapter 1, verse 1. It says, James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes in dispersion greetings. All right, now, a couple words we need to look at. He calls himself what? A slave. Now, James, a slave of God. Now, this is, this is a... A typical way that early Christian uh, uh, leaders uh, would address themselves, uh, followers of Christ would consider himself a slave to God. Uh, now, see, when we hear the word slave, it has a very what? A native connotation. All right, now, the word, the Greek word for slave is this. You want to learn a little Greek? It's D-O-U-L-O-S, doulos, okay? And uh, basically, uh, the definition is a slave who is obedient to his master. So it's not just a slave, but it's an obedient slave. All right. What's one of the things that we struggle with is being what? Obedient. I mean, there are many Catholics that find it very, very hard to be obedient to God, to the Word of God, to the teaching of the Church. But someone who is in love, you know, it says kind of like I'm a slave, but not a sort of a servile slave, but someone who wants to do what the master's telling him. You see? Uh, so maybe a little Catholic tie-in. Let's think about, you know, what's the whole purpose of being a Christian is to become ultimately what? A good person, right? Wrong. <laughs> All right, what what is it? To become what? A saint. Now what? What is the first stage of canonization? Is anybody, uh, some of you, went, I think there are a few that went on. Yeah, we call the person, the first stage is a venerable, and we call them a servant of God. Right? An example of a, a particular uh, holy man that's now a servant of God is venerable full chin. He's considered what? A servant of God. Someone who served the Lord. Right? 
but did it because he loved the Lord. You know, it's better to be a servant in heaven than a slave in hell. No, I'm sorry, than, than to reign in hell, as they would say. You know, but we have to learn to serve the Lord. You know, to be a servant. You know, to be humble, and to let Him use us as His instruments. All right. Um, now, a, a slave. Let's talk a little bit about that word. You know, slave first. A slave knows his place, right? The slave doesn't tell the master what to do. He allows the master to tell him or her what to do, right? And once again, there's just too many people telling God what to do and the church what to do. You need to change with the times. And that's not being a servant. It's being a master, you see? That was the problem with Lucifer, right? He says, I will not what? Serve, not serving, right? Uh, we have to learn. Mother Teresa used to say, I am a pencil in the hand of God. And I'm just a, just a servant. A little pencil. God can write, write with me, use me as an instrument. That's the attitude we need to grow into. The second thing about a good, a good holy servant is a servant is loyal to the master. Um, you know, another great quote of St. Uh, Blessed Mother Teresa is, we are called not to be successful, but to be faithful. We're not always successful. We're called to be a faithful servant. We learn this. And, um, you know, let's look at maybe some other lines. You know, the word, this word doulos is what the great prophets used to call themselves. So uh, let's just, just, just do maybe two of these. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 25. Okay? And how Jeremiah, one of the great prophets, uh, would address himself. So you go to Jeremiah verse 7. And then let's see, verse 25. And let's see how the, this great prophet addressed himself. And it says here, From the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt this day, I have persistently sent all my servants, the prophets, to them day after day. So he says, Anyone who works for God is God's servant. Okay? Um, I think that makes the point. So, so moving on, he's a servant of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ, and then he says to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. Now, what we're we're kind of transitioning into is who is he writing this to? All right, now, uh, like I said before, the dispersion; these people were Jews that lived outside of Palestine. Okay, for one reason or another, either they got a job transfer. Uh, many times they were kicked out of Jerusalem. You know, remember the, uh, the Romans might have kicked them out or kicked their family out of the Holy Land. Uh, now there were a lot of attacks. Where, remember, throughout the Bible, that things are going well, the Jewish people would start falling away from God. What would happen? A foreign nation would take them over, take them out of their land. They'd end up in a distant land, and then some would come back, and some would stay where? In that land. All right. So let's look at. Uh, the Assyrian attack was one of the first, one of the big ones. We see this in two Kings, Second Kings, chapter seventeen, verse twenty-three. You can look at that on your own. But to write down the, the, the notation, it's Second Kings, chapter seventeen, verse twenty-three. That's when the Assyrians came and attacked Jerusalem, and they took all the Jewish people out of uh, out of Jerusalem and brought them to their native land. Okay, and then what would happen is years later, God would set them free, but then certain people, they probably were very successful, they're thinking, well, let's just keep our Judaism here. They're free to worship as they wanted. So they had Jewish people in Assyria. Okay? Another attack happened in 580 BC. Does anyone know which attack that was? The Babylonian attack. We call the Babylonian exile, right? Babylon came, that's always a bad word in the Bible. You know, you never want to be in Babylon. It's a, sort of a word of being far away from God. You know? The whore of Babylon, right? And so all these, these words. But um, the Babylonians conquered the southern kingdom, whose cap, capital was at Jerusalem, and they brought a huge amount of Jewish people back to Babylon. And some never came home, all right? And then there was another attack. Now this, once again, you know, this might not really help us if it was run in 62 AD, because this happened in 68, 63 AD, uh, when the Romans attacked, and they, they you know, there was a big battle, and they conquered Jerusalem, and they took a lot of uh, slaves out of Jerusalem back to their own cities. All right, now, 
Um, so that's one thing. Is he's, he's writing it to the Jewish people that are outside of Jerusalem. That's what this verse is. Okay? Now, um, now the question is, is James speaking to all the Jews outside of Palestine? Is he talking to Christian Jews out of Palestine? Or can he be speaking to the whole church? We're not sure. Okay? Um, I think it was the second group. It was the Christian Jews outside of Israel. All right. So we just kind of talked about the dispersion. Let's move on. So that's kind of the opening. And now we go into sort of his first teaching. Is, and we're jumping into how do we deal with trials? And you'll notice this, this text, because he kind of jumps right into the meat of the sermon, right? He doesn't kind of warm us up with a joke. He says this, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet various trials. Or another way it can be translated in James chapter 1, verse 2, is consider all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials. Now, did any of you have in your translation the word temptations? Does anybody have that? Yeah, that's another, that's actually another translation. Trial or temptations. Huh? All right, now, in our, in our, in most of our, most of our translations, it's a trial. Now, the, uh, we'll notice that he's going to talk specifically, one, about trials, and then he's also going to talk specifically about temptation. Now, a trial, what's the difference between a trial and a temptation? Gotcha. All right, what's the difference? Where does the temptation come from? Usually the evil one. Where does the trial come from? God. <laughs> God permits it. So a lot of first time, you know, a lot of times you have here, here's something to pray about. When you're going through something, is this a trial that God's given or is this something that Satan's doing to me? Now, even if Satan's doing it, it's still a trial. If you're fighting it. But is this coming from the evil one, or is God just permitting this trial, this sort of whatever suffering I'm going through, to toughen me up? But also, if it's from the evil one, if you play it correctly, it'll make you what? Holier. Right? And one thing we have to learn is that life is a perpetual what? Spiritual combat. Right? I mean, if you're at that point, you're a mature Christian. If you're not at that point, you need to pray harder. Or you might not be living Christianity the right way. If you find Catholicism easy, you're not doing it right. It's like, you ever go to like, uh, yeah, I very rarely have ever used a trainer. Probably should have. But you ever do the trainer realize you've been doing it wrong the whole time? And they're like, do it this way. like, And it's like with a quarter of the weight, and it hurts tremendously because you weren't doing it correctly. And I think a lot of people are not living Christianity or Catholicism correctly. They find it easy. It's not an easy religion. But we need a lot of what? Grace. All right? Now... Um, so let's look at other the word for uh, te temptation or, or trial is per perosmos and the word I'll, I'll spell it out for you this will be an important Greek word maybe uh, at a cocktail party alright P-E-I-R-A-S-M-O-S and really the translation means this is when he says consider joy when we talk about this trials, the word means um, something that you go through that makes you come out stronger. That's what it means. Something that God's allowing you to go through to actually make you stronger. Now, you know, once again, you have to bring that to prayer. Think back about some trials you've had in your life, but after they simmered down, you grew in virtue. You realized you were stronger. You realize you had a big, a stronger backbone. You had more trust in God. You had a deeper prayer life. Right? That's what the cross does. Now, this is the same word that's used in the book of Genesis with Abraham. Now, which one, which story do you think I'm referring to? When Abraham put, was put to the test by God to do what? To sacrifice his only son, Isaac. The same word that's used for test here, the same Greek word is used for Abraham in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, that's used here when James says, consider all joy when you encounter various what? Trials, tests. So another word would be just you're going through a test. Right? How many know life is one big test? You better pass it. 
And even with a D minus, at least you get your purgatory. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Don't want to get an F on that one at the end. You want to you want to at least pass. Okay? That's our, our prayer. That we pass this test of life. Um, so James wants to give these early Christians, but also us, encouragement during the inevitable trials that we will encounter as we walk with Christ. Okay. That is God calling right now. <laughs> All right, it says, so So here we go. So a couple quotes. St. Catherine of Siena once remarked, nothing great is ever achieved without much enduring. Uh, St. Therese of Lisieux, the little flower, once said, <laughs> listen to this, and only saints talk this way. <laughs> Suffering is the very best gift he has given us. He gives it only to his chosen friends. How many want that friendship? Right? But he noticed that you know, God's to those that he wants to draw close to his heart, he allows them and us to experience at times sufferings. If we don't go through that, we're never going to grow. We're never going to grow up and take the, the spiritual training wheels off. I mean, name a saint. Name a saint that did not go through significant suffering. You can't find one. Now, it wasn't all the same. Some had physical sufferings. Some had really terrible emotional problems. Some had terrible marriages. But what was the difference between a saint and one that didn't die a saint? The saint persevered. And at the end, through the grace of God, they what? They came out victorious. They persevered. You see? So, another quote is, Iron is fashioned by fire as on an anvil, so the fire is suffering under the weight of trials. Our souls receive that which the Lord desires them to have. Okay, now, let's go on to the, let's go on to the text a little bit and see why trials are good for us. Now, he goes on to say, uh, for you know, remember our, our, our translation might be a bit different, okay, so bear with me. For you know that the testing of your faith produces what? How many have steadfastness? Okay, that's like me. Okay, how many have, uh, for you know the testing of your faith produces pers perseverance? Most of you. Okay, that's probably a better translation. Okay, and, and let your steadfastness or perseverance have its full effect so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Okay, you're with me? All right, so let's let's look at that. So the first word is we have to look at this word, perseverance. All right, another good Greek word maybe uh, to know is that word um, for perseverance is pupomone, H-U-P-O-M-O-N-E, okay? Uh, this is also, the, uh, it can be translated uh, into the word patience. Now, a virtue that we can all do better with, right? I mean, think about today. I honestly, don't raise your hand. How many today, how many times did, if you didn't lose it, you almost lost it? Or just almost lost your cool about something trivial? Or almost blurted out a word? Or overreacted? Okay. Some of you might be phlegmatics, okay? But if you're a sanguine or choleric, you probably, as I have 50 times, right? So now why do we why do we struggle with patience? Because in those times, whether it's other people usually, or it's some kind of inconvenience, it makes us go through a little bit of what? Suffering. You know, uh, someone's kind of stepping into our happy zone. You know, you had a plan and it got foiled because someone else got had other plans for you. Uh, you know, whatever it might be. And so it's a word, and the other word, another translation for this word is long suffering. Uh, great saints and, and, and people of character, great leaders, have an aptitude to deal with what pretty well? Setbacks and sufferings. And think about generals of armies, coaches, great coaches. Why are they great coaches? They weren't great coaches because they always won. They were great coaches because after they got pummeled, they came back and won the next season or the next game. And they didn't focus on the failure and they didn't quit because it got hard. They kept what? They kept persevering. You know, Michael Jordan, one of the greatest basketball players of all time, 
You know, you probably all know this story about his sophomore in high school. You know that story? You know they cut him from the basketball team? Can you imagine being that coach now? Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> he cut Michael Jordan? Wait, was it? I mean, maybe he wasn't that great, but Michael Jordan, when he got cut, he spent every evening making, he wouldn't go to bed until he sunk 500 foul shots. He became one of the greatest basketball players. So rather than let a trial put him down, he stepped up to the trial. Now, in a Christian sense, it's not about just willpower, but like when we have a setback, we just get all mopey, and okay, we chose some else. We go to New Life Church, that's easier. <laughs> all right, <laughs> I hope that's on video, all right? <laughs> you know, I mean, seriously, I mean, 50% of that congregation are ex-Catholics. And rather than do it right, we go to somewhere else, we just get a happy message. They didn't pass the text. Now I'll pray they come back, and I pray you get them back because they're your they're your friends. I know this. They're at your parties. I can tell by the looks on your faces. Okay, you got to get them back. Get them back to the true church that Jesus Christ has. Say, look, get back. Let's persevere. Let's go through these trials. What happened? Let's do it the right way. And when we are tested, we're able to grow in the virtue of patience, and our endurance for suffering increases. We're capable of taking bigger things and suffering for the Lord. It's just like weight training, right? You know, you, you lift a little bit, you do a little bit, but then over time, greater and greater weights. But even with the grace of God, the more that we go through trials, guess what? We have to do greater things. And God needs to what? He needs to toughen us up, doesn't he? He really does. And we have to go through trials. Uh, Monsignor Pope uh, comments on this word, hubomone, and he says it's, nece it's a necessary virtue of a Christian man. He says this, Life is hard and the challenges are many. We either meet these challenges or cave under them. In this sense, life is a test. In hardship, we discover that what we are made of. We learn we are strong and where we need growth. Right? You know, so you go through trial, what we need to do? We need to put ourselves in front of who? The Lord. And say, Lord, where do I need to grow? What do I learn from that failure? You know, how can I do better in the next, you know, next time I encounter this? Um, in the early church, the thing that baffled the Romans is that the martyrs did not die greatly, they died singing. That's a great quote I found. They were so moved, the Romans were so impressed by the, by the Christians that when they went to their death, they weren't like crying, they were singing praises, knowing that after the lion devoured them, they wake up in heaven. That's a lot of faith, by the way. <laughs> You know, you might think, this better be right. <laughs> I better wake up and there better be paradise on the other side of this after I'm a meal for this animal, right? But, you know, they had, in the early church, they had such just amazing faith. I mean, today, people are so weak. You know, Father Ken and I had dinner with a nice town, like, down in St. Catharines. Just, like, there was no one in church last week. You know? I mean, where is everybody? You know, it gets, the weather gets a little nice and there was... You know, out there boozing it, you know. That's uh, you know, got soccer games and I mean come on. Where's where's it, you know, where where you know the Lord is his, his due? You just toughen up a little bit. We gotta become like the early church again. We become the, the church of soft, right? We become way too soft in the Catholic Church. You know? And I think you and I'll tell you what, the young people, I'm seeing young people show up the older people today. I'm seeing it in young kids. I, I, think, I think our Lord is preparing an army of saints right now for something coming around the bed. I'm convinced of that. Right? Uh, now, the trial leads a person who for many, but, but, you know, so we, all right, fine, we get more patient. Well, so what? Verse 4 says this, and let the perseverance be perfect so that you may be perfect, complete, and lacking in nothing. Okay, so... Three things that the perseverance leads to, right? Or what's the other word we might have? The other, steadfast, staying firm, like st sticking with it. And what's the hardest thing for us as Christians? Is sticking with our plan. All right, think about it. You make a resolution, what happens? Yeah, it's like, you know, I mean, all right, let's take, let's take an easy one, okay? Um, we had the Rosary Confraternity. And what was the plan? 
that everyone who joined up, all 276 people that joined up, were to pray three rosaries a week. Now, if I took a poll and I could get a dollar for every person that stuck with it, how much money would I get in the Sacred Heart Bank account, you think? Probably two hundred fifty dollars. Do you think is that high? No. No. I mean, now if you, I mean, just, but you just see a lack of what? Perseverance. Perseverance. You know, we're very weak, and so that's why we need a lot of grace. But let's say we stick with it. All right, we stick with the three virtues, whatever the whatever it might be. Daily mass. We stick with prayer. We we don't give up. We realize that God, there, there's light at the end of the tunnel. That God will get us through this, and we we just stick to it. In good times and bad. And sickness and health. Where'd you hear that? Your marriage. You stick to it. But you know, your relation with Jesus Christ is also what? It's a mystical marriage. There's promises you make. Right? He says so it'll lead to perfection, completion, and lacking nothing. What are the three words? Perfection, second thing, completion, and the third, lacking nothing. Right? That's what steadfastness or perseverance leads to, James says. All right, so let's look at these words. And it's good to look at the Greek, okay? So the first is perfection. Now, the Greek word for perfection is teleos. Have you ever heard that before? If you ever took, if you ever took uh, philosophy, this was a big word, teleos. All right? The spelling is T-E-L-E-I-O-S. All right, now... What, it, what this word means, remember this is probably written, to, this is written outside of Jerusalem, so the text probably was written in Greek, because in these lands, outside of Jerusalem, a lot of them spoke what? Greek. Right? A lot of the Bible came from the Greek. That's why the best Bible scholars, they know Greek. Right? This guy in seminary, Ben Kazmarski, he was brilliant. He could, he could read the Bible in Greek. I couldn't believe it. He's been in the Holy Hour. I'm like, well, what are you doing? He's like, reading the Bible. <laughs> He was that smart, you know? But anyway, uh, the word means when we move towards our given end, our purpose, okay? Our purpose, our, or we become what we're supposed to be, okay? So for, an inst for, in for instance, a, a hammer, the, the telio, so the purpose of the hammer is to drive nails. You know, to use a hammer to you know, put your thumbtacks into the, uh, you know, the cork board probably wouldn't be necessary. It's, it's purpose, right? But what is, remember, we, what is our purpose? To become what? Saints. Saints. I mean, so what our Lord, what our Lord is saying, what the Holy Spirit is saying, is that, that if we persevere through trials, we're going to get to, God's going to form us into the purpose that he had for us. We'll be the person that we're supposed to be. Now, it's a little bit, uh, Cheeky, but Matthew Kelly, he kind of defines holiness as the following. Being the perfect version of yourself. Okay? Now, you know, you think about it, that kind of makes sense. Because I have my way of becoming holy, you've got your way of becoming holy. But ultimately, we're all going to be perfect by the time this is done. Okay, and it's either going to happen now, or it's going to happen when? In purgatory. Alright, so... Let's do it now. Let's work on it now. So there's little work to be done later. Okay? So, so it means also a person who has achieved consummate human integrity and virtue. Like consummate integrity. What's integrity? Just that person. We've become so who we're supposed to be that we're the same person in church as we are in the shopping Cart line. We're the same person in the car in traffic that we are in adoration. We're the same person when you're with those family members that you can't stand. That from not your family, but from the family you married into. <laughs> and you're the same person. You speak the same as you do in your church groups. You are perfect. You're becoming perfect. Why? You've grown in virtue. Patience, kindness, chastity, self-control. You're, 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 and, and why? Because you've been through so much. You've been through many fires. You're able, you know, I've been there, done that. I'm, I'm kind of in bigger fights now, right? But you can't, we can't get there, James says, unless we're willing to <coughs> go through the trial. We're going to persevere. So it makes us perfect. 
Uh, Pope Francis, in his um, in his new letter on holiness, he stre he said this. Um, Strengthened by so, he, he talks. He, he references scripture, but he, he he talks about like the saints next door. And he says there are so many and such great means of salvation. All the faithful, whatever their condition and state, are called by the Lord, each in his or own way, so that perfect holiness by which the Father Himself is perfect. He says we all are called ultimately to be perfectly holy. And that's a question. You know, a lot of times when I you know teach the kids, I'm like, all right, here's the trivia question. In order to get to heaven, you need to be perfect. Now, what do they all say? No. And then what I tell them? Wrong. <laughs> and you know, because a lot of times we don't, we don't believe that. And what did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 5? He said, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So God needs to per purify and make our love perfect. Now, isn't it true? Let's, I mean, you're thinking, I mean, a lot of times we read scripture, now you're getting discouraged. Like, oh, gosh, you got a lot of work to do. All right. But compare yourself now to 20 years ago. Do you love a little better? Can you take a little more pain than you used to? Do you let things you kind of roll off your back a little easier? Right? A little more patient, more kind, self-control. Right? Well, what got you there? Pain. <laughs> you know, they say marathon runners, they're not, the best marathoners are not people in their you know 18 19 20 you know who the best marathon is in their 40s 50s why they're able to deal with pain better when you get to mile 20 it's like oh, no problem then they're done they do it every day <laughs> you see what i mean life just has a way of sort of through the trials of life if we accept it it makes us stronger right it is perfect the james argues that Perfection and holiness usually comes through trials and suffering. St. Teresa of Avila says, We always find those who walk closest to Christ were those who had the greatest trials. Ouch. Yeah, and that always scares me. I'm like, you know, like, as as a priest, I'm like, all right, when's it going to happen where I get the hammer? <laughs> you know, like, you know, in other words, I mean, I've had sufferings, but compared to what I hear, I'm like, God's been really good to me. And I know, like, I want to get it someday, you know? But, it, but it's true, you gotta be, but you know what? Maybe not ready yet, you know? And so, but we have to realize that when it does happen, that it's not necessarily always a curse. Many times it's why a blessing in disguise to repair us to see the Lord. All right, now, uh, one more quote, and we'll go to the next word. St. Ignatius of Aloha says, if God sent you many sufferings, it is a sign that he has great plans for you and certainly wants you to make you a saint. Right? She's going to make you a saint. You know? Alright, secondly, so the first thing is it leads to telios is what? What's the Greek word, the, the English word? Perfection. Alright? So sufferings lead us to uh, perfection and love. If we encounter them in the right way. Okay? Alright. Uh, when we get to an hour, we're going to cut it off. Okay? Alright, secondly, it leads to per perseverance, which is uh, so, and then second, perseverance leads to completeness. Now, not ready for another Greek word? All right, the word completeness is holokleros, H-O-L-O-K-L-E-R-O-S, holokleros, um, which is translated as perfect in every part. Now, the word, this is interesting, the word in scripture uh, was used a lot for an animal that was fit to be offered to God for the priest for a sacrifice. Now, I mean, it was this holocleros, this word Greek, is that the sacrifice had to be perfect before you could offer it to God. Now, think about it. What's the only perfect sacrifice that we offer? The Eucharist. Now, before that, what did they offer as a sacrifice to God usually for the atonement of sins? Yeah, unblemished land. Now, was it perfect? I mean, it was perfect in human standards, but that word holocleros, it's, it's that word, that perfect sacrifice, right? So really, our, our, our life is supposed to be a perfect sacrifice to the Lord. You know, think about, uh, how many of you pray the morning offering you get up in the morning? My Lord, my God, offer my thoughts, words, deeds, and actions of today. 
our attention to the Pope is just not a faithful praying to you, right? And like, Lord, I realize today, whatever happens, good or bad, I offer as a sacrifice to you. You know, what's your sacrifice? It's your work, it's your family life, it's your struggles, it's your prayer life. I mean, it's a sacrifice. I mean, to even get our prayer done, right? I know, gee, I gotta run the shirt and get this in because if I don't do it, then a Bible study, I know. I get it run it, do it. Sacrifice. No TV. Go to chapel. Sacrifice. Right? And so, it, remember, uh, without, without blemishes. And so, uh, what he's saying here is that sufferings removes blemishes and weaknesses and also the blemishes of sin. Okay, now, think about our Catholic theology. When we go through our physical suffering, right? Uh, there was a story, I, I was just on retreat, and uh, the, during the meals, you know, on the women's retreat, we're probably gonna listen to this, I don't know, the five great loves. And in that, in that CD, they were talking about uh, this priest who went to see John Paul II, uh, and he had just broken his leg, right? And uh, so, he was looking for some sympathy and compassion from the Holy Father. Now, if you know anything about the life of John Carol Rutil and John Paul II, um, he was one tough dude. Okay, so I, I don't think he was impressed by the young priest's broken leg. <laughs> so hey, the guy came up, he's like, Your Holiness, I broke my leg, you know? And he says, Offer it up. And he slapped him in the face. <laughs> oh, that's sorry. <laughs> Baby, you know, and, uh, but he, you know, he he always understood uh, the the value. Like, you know, in other words, did you know, like, if you're going through a suffering, you can offer it up for past, you know, the effects of past sins. You know, Lord, if I have like some, you know, a trail of purgatory time, like, okay, I'll offer up this pain in my leg for for that, you know, or or you're in like some boring meeting, you're just like. Oh, Lord, help me. You know, just offer it up with a smile. You know, but fake them out. Make them think you really love what's going on. And offer up that suffering as an oblation, as a holocleros, right? And it, what it does is it removes blemishes from the past. You know, we, we believe this. You know, that whole thing of offer it up actually works. You know, now growing up, I, I just, I truly believe when mom told me that, that's just the Catholic way of saying, shut up and suck it up, you know? <laughs> now, and I know my mom meant it that way, too. <laughs> I, no, but she, you know, she offered up as all the brothers are, you know? I'm like, you know, why don't you offer it up? You know, but as a priest, you know, I realized, I mean, that's true. We've got, we've got to learn that, you know, either either you're going to make suffering turn into a big grouch and just moody and, and everyone knows what you're going through and, you know, it's or you just accept it yes. and say, all right, Lord, I mean, I, there's nothing I can do about this, so I offer it up. Yes. And, yeah, it's a kind of way. I mean, see, Joel Osteen doesn't have that theology. <laughs> if, if you went to Joel Osteen and said, hey, Joel, why don't you offer it up? He'd have no idea what you're talking about. He wouldn't. They don't have, in the prosperity gospel, they don't have a theology of suffering. You know, that's why a lot of times when you go to the emergency room, they call for a priest. Because they know, well, at least we've got that, that corner market. We can find meaning in this. Like the pastor's like, I don't know. That's not my prosperity gospel here. He must have did something wrong, you know? Your, your, your family member's sick and suffering. Uh, did you pay your tithes this year? You know, I mean, I, I mean, seriously. They don't understand what Christianity is. But we do. All right, now, um, we already, I was going to say a word of purgatory, but that's essentially what this is, is that, you know, essentially that if we don't finish it here, that there, will be a, there will be a suffering that will perfect us to make it that perfect, perfect and lacking in nothing, all blemishes will be removed, everything. Even our imperfections. Even our imperfections will be removed. It's beautiful. You know, but you know, here's the thing. It can happen on earth. Because I think God sends us enough suffering to deal with it, but when he sends it, we just we don't deal with it well. We just kind of get resentful and oh gosh, you're cursing me and uh man, complain and tell everybody in the world about it. <laughs> you know? Alright. So, last, thirdly, perseverance will lead to lacking in nothing. Now, um, do you want the Greek or just, just move on? 
Move mm -hmm. on? Okay, all right, no Greek. Okay, so it says, the word lacking nothing, this is interesting. I mean, I was just, without the word, I'll just say, it, is left at the side, which means that you will have the power to defeat an army. You'll be lacking in nothing. You'll be so strong that you'll have the power in yourself to defeat an army. I was listening to a, a podcast on the perfection of the soul about how, you know, there's something on prayer, but also the end of times, and actually about the particular judgment. And if you're going to look at the tree, we're going to talk about this. Like, what happens when you die? What's that look like? And it said about Saint, I think it was Saint Teresa of Avila, or what it Saint Catherine of Siena. Uh, she was going through a lot of suffering, but I think Satan actually appeared to her and just trying to mess with her, and he just gave up because he realized she's just so perfect, I can't get her anymore. Like she was so strong spiritually, and she'd been through so much that the evil woman could do nothing with her. She had the power of what? An army. She was lacking in nothing. How do you spell that word? You said you didn't want it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. The word is L E I. P-E-S-T-H-A-I. Lepistai. Okay, so, um, day by day with God's grace, we will, will, if we persevere, become stronger and stronger, be lacking nothing. And uh, so we know this, is that while suffering is a response to evil, it's not an evil in itself. And our belief as Catholics is that when redeemed by grace, suffering can contribute to our growth as human beings. Okay? So that's why he says, consider all joy, brothers, when you encounter various what? Trials. Okay, so tomorrow, when you have your daily pinpricks, trials, realize this is just another test. And, and here, Father Dan, a, a great line, Father Dan Leary, and I, it just stuck in me. I was in one of his homilies. He said, every opportunity is an opportunity for grace or sin. Make it an opportunity for grace. I mean, just listen to the Holy Spirit. You know, ask your guardian angel to help you. You know, here we go again. All right, how am I going to deal with this situation, this trial? You know, and so, and then what happens is you begin to have what's called a more, we would call as Catholics, a supernatural outlook, right? Supernatural outlook. That means seeing things as what? As God sees them. Now, this goes into my next line. How much time do we have? 15 minutes. Great. Excellent. So, all right, let's go, I think we're on verse 5, right? So let's look, if, uh, all right, so let's just finish this verse 4, I'll read it one more time. In my translation, it says, and let steadfastness have its full effect, and that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. At this rate, we're going to finish in 2020, because we just finished four lines. Okay. <laughs> if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all men generously and without reproaching. Okay, now, what's the key word we need to look at? Lacks, right? No, wisdom, right? If any of you lacks wisdom, he says, he says, ask God who gives it to you generously and ungrudgingly. Okay, now, circle that word or just in your mind with your finger or pencil, what is wisdom? Wisdom is one of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Where do we receive the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit? Trivia question? Wrong. Where do we receive them? Baptism. Very good. Where were they strengthened? Okay, good. There's your theological uh, tidbit for today. Okay, most people get that wrong. Oh, I guess the seven gifts were given in confirmation. No, you already got those gifts, but they're strengthened in you. All right, when those 25 kids upstairs on 1130 Mass, they were strengthened. Well, with these gifts. They already had them. But now they're doing full force. It was sort of, a, sort of a, what is that? Cortisone shot, right? Or steroids, right? To help them, to make them stronger, right? Is that good, right? Cortisone? Did I get that right? Is that good or not? That's not a good, got not a good, not a good, steroids. Yeah, steroids. All right. <laughs> it's like, yeah, Advil, what are you talking about? All right. Um, yeah, so it's it's the steroids, you know, but you know, the stuff makes you stronger, anabolic steroids for the soul, right? Now what is wisdom? Father John Hardin uh, defines wisdom as the following. It is the power of the Holy Spirit to judge and order things in accordance with divine norms and with a connaturality that flows from a loving union with God. 
Okay, so it means, what does it mean? So it's to judge and order things in accordance with divine norms. Why? What's happening here, and how do I see God in this moment? It's seeing things from a perspective that God sees it, with that supernatural outlook. Okay? Another way of saying it is a person will see and evaluate things, both joy and sorrow, pleasure and pain, success and failure from God's point of view. Okay, now, how many times have you asked this question, why did that happen? I mean, isn't it a big question in our life? Why, Lord? Why? Why, 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 why? But what we should be asking is, what are you teaching me? Now, what's happening here? I mean, you, another thing is, you, you almost have to have a supernatural outlook. I mean, uh, maybe just a, an anecdote or a story to make my point is, a couple weeks ago, my basketball coach, my JV basketball coach, uh, Kevin, Kevin Dower, um, he, his oldest son uh, was coming home or going to work at 10 in the morning uh, on his motorcycle got slammed killed. And you know, my father saw him at a prayer meeting and gave him a big hug and he, and he told me, he said, I am so impressed about how he's taking this. You know, but at his son's funeral, you know we had at his son's funeral? He had an adoration and confession for two hours for all the people. He wanted people to pray adoration for his family and his son. I mean, how often do you see that? That's called a supernatural perspective. Now, there's no doubt that he's in a ton of pain. But the thing is, there, he has enough faith that he sees that God will make good out of it. And he knows this, my son received the sacrament before he died. You know, I mean, otherwise, you fall into what? Despair. There's no point. You know, wisdom, that's the gift of wisdom, that I can see things from God's perspective. Now, someone who's not in the state of grace, someone who doesn't have the grace of the Holy Spirit cannot think that way. That's a gift to be able to see through that much pain and see that God has a purpose for this. Remember, I was telling you, maybe I was thinking it was during Lent, I was driving to Riken High School and St. Aloysius Church has a little sign on the way and it said, God has a purpose for your pain. Now, if you see that God has a purpose for your pain, you also have the gift of wisdom to see that. Okay? You have the gift to see that. All right? Now, when you ask for it, how does God give? He gives it what? Generously. All right? Uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church in her teaching on prayer has a quote which I love to reference, and it's from the famous Saint Evagrius. <laughs> I've never heard a confirmation kid pick Evagrius, you know? <laughs> Uh, but anyway, maybe your grandkids can and tell them about it. And it says this, Do not be troubled if you do not immediately receive from God what you ask of Him, for He desires to do something even greater for you while you cling to Him in prayer. Right? So we have to, first off, we pray to God, and I, I've learned this, I've learned this very slowly as a priest, but it's, I, I, sometimes I'm so astounded about how good God is. It's like asking, and I'm like, ah, and then I'm like, wow, God, you are generous. And if, if he knows it's good for you, guess what? He will give it to you. But at his time, when he wants and how he wants. But if you're a Christian and, you're, and we're a Catholic, we have to see this, that God is, he always answers our prayers, but we have to have that hope, right? And that faith that he is generous. I think sometimes even we ask, you ever had that experience where, you know, you're praying to God, like, okay, God, well, um, here's my prayer. Well, I'm not going to ask you too much, okay? Um, I don't want to imposis, be an imposition on your time. I know you're a very busy guy. You know, <laughs> people say the priest all the time. I know mean, you're very busy, but, you know. But, but the thing is, do you ask big? I mean, do you go big with God? Do you ask, you know, ask for the biggie? What's, why not? If you're, if you're looking, if you're going through something, ask for the miracle. Some people are even afraid to ask for a miracle. You know why? Because they're afraid they're going to be what? Let down. Or embarrassed. Or embarrassed. But like, will a miracle happen? Amen. A miracle will happen. It might not be the miracle you want. 
But God does promise to work what? A miracle. And I think there are too many Catholics. I mean, this is where the, I think some of the Pentecostal churches, I mean, when they pray, they go big, you know? Like my, uh, my cook, Cynthia, she's like, I, I just asked the Lord if he could provide it for me, Father. She says that all the time. She just provided for me. God is generous. I'm like, you must have been reading the book of James. <laughs> yeah, that's Catholic. Like, what what I is that? Uh, how do you worship the Bible? You know? You know uh, but, but yeah, I mean, the other thing is, do we, I mean, the question is, do you believe that God is generous? Yes. All right, now, then he goes on, he says, he shows how God gives, but then he talks about how we should ask. He says, that how the asker must ask? We must ask without doubts. Now, this is very convicting for me, because I know when I read this, I'm like, oh boy. How many times have I gone to prayer sort of like, kind of sheepish, and, all right, you know, sort of like that, I don't know. It's, he says, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave in the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. He's saying, when you ask, ask with what? Trust and confidence and faith. All right? Now, uh, a Bible commentary talks about this, this wave in the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind and says that one who prays with doubts is like a cork carried by the waves now near the shore and now far away. You know, you know, like when you go to the ocean, and like there's like some bottle, and they're like, hey, look, and all of a sudden it's like way out. I mean, that's like a person that prays with doubt. I mean, you're, you're all like a bobblehead. You know, your head just going all over the place when you're praying. I, I, you know, for some reason, that, that image, that's just a personal prayer thing I got, is praying like that with doubts is like a bobblehead. Where, but it's not going like this, it's going like this, all over the place. You know, doubting. And, and our Lord is saying, when we pray, we should pray with what? With confidence. And like I said, does God always answer our prayers? Yes. But the answer might not be what we want. Or when we want. Okay? Um, and then text, and then in the text in verse 8, it says, For that person must not suppose, must not suppose that a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways, will receive anything from the Lord. Now notice. St. James says, he says, if you ask with it, with uh, with doubts, he says, don't expect anything. You know, and I think maybe that's maybe that's something you need to bring to prayer. Maybe you're not getting it because you don't have faith. You're not praying with uh, with with trust. I think. Yeah, commentary. Go ahead. I think right there, a lot of times, you're ashamed. You you don't feel. The reason you don't feel confident is you know you don't deserve it. Exactly, you've been sinning. Okay, who here deserves anything from God? Raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> All right, because if you raise your hand, you fail the test. Keep your hands down. We don't deserve anything, Bill. What is grace? It's a gift received at Christ's expense. All right, for instance, confession. Do we like deserve to be forgiven for what we do? No, that's what mercy means. We're receiving what we don't deserve. I mean, in other words, it, grace is a gift. And that's, I think that's where it's Catholics. We're a little bit off. Because I think we're, we kind of have this sort of, uh, we can get a little bit superstitious about prayer. If I do this no mean and these prayers and this many Hail Marys, and if I just punch the card hard enough, then God's going to do what I want. Is that how it works? No. But we have this punch card mentality. That's not how it works. That's, it's one of the things that the Pope uh, uh, warns against Pelagianism. You know, in other words, like just willing it. You know, if I just push her, I'll just change it up. God's mind's already made up. He already has a plan for you. He just wants you to trust. Now, in order to re understand that, you do have to pray. And you do have to punch the card. But it's not because you deserve, you're going to like change God's mind. But you're going to be able to receive what he's going to give you. And what happens is the more you pray, the more you spend in adoration, the more you begin to see how God's working in your life. Do you know why a lot of people aren't getting the things they want? They're asking for a billion dollar question answer with a 10 cent prayer life. They want that billion dollar answer with a 10 cent prayer life and a 10%, 10 cent trust. Right? And I think too, it's very humble. Like, I am very humble. I've got to point out where I'm very humble when God gives me. I'm like, wow. I mean, why do you do this, Lord? 
But we have to realize that we don't deserve it. Maybe that's the answer to your prayer right there. And maybe that we have to get over this like, well, you know, I've got to be perfect before God answers my prayers. Well, guess what? It ain't going to happen. That's not how it works. When you start praying and you start getting close to God, He begins to make you perfect. He makes you perfect. Not you make yourself perfect. And He does it the way He does. And sometimes it's the trials. And sometimes it's the not giving one. And it's 8 o'clock. So we're in there. All right. Okay, mark your Bibles. What, what verse do we get to? Very good. Verse 8. All right, so at this, at this rate, we will finish in 2025. Okay? All right, so for your, for your, um, your penance, no, let's get it. Let's say for your penance, please read the rest of James. Uh, no, for, for your homework, I want you to read slowly just chapter 1, okay? I'll try to go a little bit faster next time. But I think this is uh, this is actually a great way to... Um, that's actually perfect because we uh, we just finished um, the first section on faith and wisdom. That's actually a perfect ending. And the next thing he talks about is poverty and riches and how to not show favoritism to certain things. Now, a lot of times, you know, even Catholics come to churches like, you know, I don't feel welcome here and all this other stuff. Okay, but we can look at how we can sort of Put that aside and and uh, and not show partiality to people. And then he talks about how to deal with temptations. You know, like you know, a lot of times he, he just says is you know don't say God's tempted me. He says it's it's probably the evil one, but he gives some solid advice on how to deal with it. Okay, with God's help. All right, is that going good? All right, let me pray to our Father and oh, no, Father, some Holy Spirit. Well, open up for questions. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.